All right. We're going to uh, continue on a series that we began last week entitled Making Fear Bow. Amen? Amen. Now, I don't know about all of you. Maybe you're superhuman. You never have any type of trials or tribulations or anything that instills fear in you. But um, for the, us normal mortals, sometimes that comes to play sometimes. You know, it could be something as uh, significant as, as a disease or it could be you know, you hear of layoffs at your job, uh, things going on in the economy, accidents, all kinds of things um, occur in our lives that can help instill a, a sense of fear in us. And um, uh, before we go further, let's just look at our text scripture for this series. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. A sound mind. Not schizophrenic, not tossed to and fro, not one day I trust God and the next, oh God, where you at? Uh, but to have a mindset of soundness, in other words, stability, that through thick, thick and thin trials and tribulations, you have the mindset that despite the situation I'm dealing with, I still know that God is present, amen, and a very present help in time of trouble. So let's open up the word of prayer, and we're going to continue on. Amen. Uh, Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, the honor, and praise for everything you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Father, as we would study your word today. Father, that whether we're dealing with some type of fear right now, or whether there's something on the horizon, uh, maybe there's somebody in our life that is uh, dealing with fear right now and uncertainty, and you would use your word and, and through your spirit enable us to speak peace and contentment and comfort into their lives. Whatever the case, Lord, we just ask you that we would just absorb your word and your principles and that we would be armed, amen, mind, body, and spirit to touch the lives of other people uh, when fear tries to rear its ugly head. And we just give you the praise and honor and glory for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Now, as I said last week, uh, it says here, God has not given us a spirit of fear. So right off the bat, if you're feeling anxious, nervous, Skin crawling, uh, about to bite your toe. Your Lord, bite your toenails. You're in trouble. You're very flexible. You're in trouble. <laughs> bite your fingernails. Hair falling out. Heart racing. All those different things. Um, as we see here, God has not given me that spirit. So therefore, you should be able to immediately identify if I'm feeling the sensation. It's not of God. So I'd like to do whatever is necessary to get myself centered back in God's presence and with God's mindset so I can drive that fear out of my life. And as I said, um, that word fear in underlying Greek means timidity, dread, and here's what we got to watch, faithlessness. Wow, God told us to be people of faith. But when you allow fear to come in, I'm not saying that you've totally given up on God, that you've backslidden. But you have to face the reality that when fear is starting to overwhelm your mind or overwhelm your heart, that you're not in the presence of the Lord laying down, amen, in green pastures by the still waters. You've allowed yourself to venture out of the place of rest, and now thoughts and different things have come in that have shaken you in the area wherever this fear is emanating. And it's allowing faithlessness, a lack of trust in God to come into the picture. And we can try to deny that, but quite frankly, all the times that we've really felt fear the deepest. If you really go back and look at it, did your mind go to a scripture that would make you feel strong? Did you sing a song that uplifts you and edifies you? When you're in that moment where you're gripped by fear, quite frankly, your mind is obsessing over whatever thing it is that's causing you anxiety. It could be spirit fear of spiders. It could be fear of heights. It could be, oh, I'm not going to get fired today. It could be, oh, I got to go to this meeting at 3.30 and my report's not ready. Whatever that thing is that's causing fear to come on the horizon, you've allowed yourself to deviate or be diverted from God's word, and now you've gone into from the comfort zone of God's spirit and his principles, and you've navigated yourself over emotionally or, or mentally into a place where this discomfort, this distrust, this lack of faith, or once again, anxiety has started to take hold of you. So we gotta see that for what it is. And here's the thing, fear could be a natural thing, 
Or as we see here, there's also a spirit of fear. There are uh, satanic or demonic influences from this world system that try to uh, attack or bombard your thought life with a sense of fear. So another thing you gotta do is also distinguish, is this fear something that's naturally in me or is the enemy planting thoughts in my head? Am I dealing with situations, places, or people that make me uncomfortable? And once you can isolate what the source is, then through the word of God, you can fortify yourself to overcome it. Amen? Now, last week we looked at reasons for, well, reasons why we're attacked with fear. We looked at some of the physical impacts of fear. Then we started looking at some of the types of fear, which went into innate irrational fears. Fear of the dark, fear of spiders, fear of clowns. <laughs> uh, we looked at how fear can be instilled in us through others and their, their experiences. They speak fear into our lives, sometimes accidentally. Then we talked about experiential fear. Fear that comes through some type of trauma we've experienced um, that causes it to stick with us. Amen. And we carry the baggage of some type of trauma that now when we think of that situation or something reminds us of, uh, of it, fear comes back in. Now today we're going to go a little further and we're going to look at some of the causes of fear. Amen. Some of the causes of fear. And one of the first things you've got to realize is that fear enslaves people. Once again, fear enslaves people. When you think about your most fearful moments, you feel like you're squeezed by whatever uh, thought or situation is coming your way. You feel like you're boxed into a corner, you're trapped in a cage. And uh, sometimes you have that fight or flight response where you just wanna run for dear life or scream or sometimes you feel irrational, I, I just gotta get out of here. Fear traps you, it boxes you in, it makes you its prisoner. It's, it's the most devastating foe. It, it taunts you. And sometimes it, it screams things at you that aren't even the reality, but yet, even though the situation you dread may not occur, the fear is still speaking to you and it's affecting your perceptions of things as well as reality. You know, am I going to survive this? Am I going to endure this? Will I get out on the other side of this situation? That's what fear does. You got to realize that it's a crippling, devastating force that tries to hold you at bay. And God, as we see here, would not have us to be bound by fear. There's going to be times that in our humanity, amen, our emotional beings, we're going to suffer things that cause us to be filled with a sense of fear. But God says, I haven't given you that spirit of fear, and therefore I've given you solutions to overcome that fear. Look for those, those resolutions, amen? Don't sit there and be a prisoner of that fear. Sometimes you got to look fear in the eye and challenge it and say, I'm not going to be bound by you anymore. You're not going to hold me captive. You're not going to put your foot on my neck and, and prevent me from fulfilling my destiny or taking advantage of this opportunity. You're not going to have this power over my life anymore. And I shared years ago, I was chronic with asthma for three and a half years. Um, I was in this car accident. I got knocked across uh, the White Horse Pike, and it was a cold night, and it was raining, and unfortunately, I had to get out of my car, so, you know, I'm not even in a place where I feel any bodily pain. I get out of my car, and I'm just trying to get out of that, that situation, my car being in the middle of the highway, sideways, a truck here, two other vehicles there, so I get to the side over to a safe place, but rain is coming down on me. It's very cold, and next thing you know, I'm having my first asthma attack. And I suffered that for three and a half years. And, and there's times where, um, as a lot of people will share, I've even seen military articles where sometimes they capture prisoners and if they find out that they're asthmatic, they attack them in the area they're breathing because that, they know that's an opening, an entry gate to fear manifesting in their lives. So for me, I went from having no fear of my breathing or anything to not only suffering three and a half years of, of, of asthma attacks and sometimes panic attacks relating to that, that put me in life-threatening situations where I literally got rushed to the hospital, but there was times where I was breathing perfectly well, but in my mind, it was saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, amen? That's the type of power that fear can have over you. 
And I had to get to the place where I start to find solutions. I would find scriptures that edify me. I would repeat songs in my head or, or play songs all day if necessary. And after a while, I got to the place where I said, I'm going to look fear in the eye. I'm going to challenge you. And that's what enabled me to overcome that fear, and that, that flight or, or, or fight or flight response that I would have in my head even when nothing was coming my way. So one of the first things we have to realize is that Sometimes fear is not just something that is innate or naturally in us. It can be something that we learn as we encounter various situations, as we deal with different people, as we sometimes ponder uh, the possibilities of things and things look negative. Sometimes we allow fear to come on the horizon. And sometimes, as I said before, there are spiritual influences that try to instill fear in us. The book of Hebrews talks about um, you know, angels that minister to the heirs of salvation. Well, guess what? There's angels that minister edification and comfort uh, to the God's saints. There's also, in the corrupted kingdom of Satan, there are demonic spirits that try to instill fear in us. Amen? And we don't have to dread them. We just have to be aware that they exist, and we have to use the weapon of our warfare to overcome them. Now, as I said, fear is something that we learn. And if you consider a baby, let's look at Zoe. Zoe is, at this point in her life, is fearless. She knows that when I cry, I have total faith that somebody's going to pick me up. If I cry because I'm, I need to be changed, I need to eat. She knows that her nurturing, her, 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 her safety, uh, heal, ministering healing to her if she's sick, her provisions, every aspect of her life or one cry away from her loving family that nurtures her, nurtures her. Amen. So at this point in her life, she doesn't learn. She doesn't know fear whatsoever. But as she goes through life, unfortunately, certain things are going to start to happen that you start to learn fear. We got to realize that if we can learn fear, we can start to unlearn fear. Amen. Amen? You can start to unlearn fear. Think about that. Some of the things that you might have dreaded for years, and you know, fear is something that's very personal to each one of us. The things that instill fear in me may not impact somebody else. And then something I see is very minimal. You'd be like, oh, that's, that scares the heck out of me. Amen? I talked about before, when I was a little kid, man, I'd scale a building, a tree, like it was nothing. Amen? Tall fences, like hey, twice my height. I could practically bound over them. I got a little bit older, and my mind started saying, well, if I fall, I can break something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, you know, afraid, like definitely afraid of heights, but there's a, a respect that sometimes gets a little anxiety in there if I have to scale up too high. So that's just an example of how you learn, unfortunately, various fears. You just got to realize whether the fear um, you're learning is something that is overwhelming you and keeping you captive from the things that God has in store for your life. If they're having that kind of power over you, you got to, once again, study the word and pray and ask God for the strength to overcome those things that are keeping you bound. Because as long as you're bound, you're not going to fulfill the fullness of what God has for you, nor are you going to experience everything that God wants to bless you with. You're going to live through life with a veil of anxiety hanging over you. Amen. I remember years ago, they used to have this uh, commercial with this woman that was studying, I mean, suffering from depression. It's for some type of medication, and, you know, on the commercial, she's walking around, and there's this cloud following her. And then she takes the pill, and, and the cloud goes away. Some of us have a cloud of fear that's following us everywhere we go. We need to learn how to combat it, not with a pill, but by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Learn how to overcome fear. So anyway, let's look at some of the, the causes of fear. One of the first one is that, Unfortunately, sometimes we trust in the flesh. Trust in the flesh. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 7. Amen. 2 Chronicles 32, 7 through 8. It says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, for, nor for all the multitude that is with him, for there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now notice this. 
Um, they're being encouraged by Hezekiah, be strong, be courageous. Don't let you know, the invading army or the, the, you know, the Syrians that are coming in to attack us, don't let them instill fear in you. Instead, he said, look, they might seem to be greater in number. Uh, maybe they have better weapons. Maybe we got 20,000 troops, they got 40,000, but despite their supposed fleshly might, they are trusting in an arm of, of flesh, amen? And one thing you got to understand biblically is when it talks about an arm of flesh, it's, talk about, it's, it's a designation for human weakness, amen? It's a trust in the weak, the weak frail, mortal men over the might of the Lord. So as you look at your everyday situations, what are you looking to? Are you afraid of people at your place of business, at your school, uh, different organizations? Uh, you're dealing with a medical issue or there's people in your family. Are you trusting in an arm of flesh? What is the flesh saying is going to happen? What are the things of this world system saying are about to occur? Or as we see here, uh, the world, the things of this world have an arm of flesh, and that's the limitation of what they can do. But it says, with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. In other words, it doesn't matter how strong the enemy is. Do you trust the Lord our God to help us overcome, and not only overcome, to fight our battles on our behalf? Which one do you trust in? You know, as they say, if we were to use our intellect and all our fleshly uh, schemes and strength, we couldn't find our way out of paper bag <laughs> in some of the situations we face. But we trust in the Lord a lot of times. He'll tell us to stand still and see his salvation. Amen. Sometimes we can just praise God like we saw at the battle of Jericho, and God will bring forth a miracle to turn our situation around. You know, but once again, do we trust in what we see? Do we trust in the fleshly strength, you know, or the numbers of people that are opposing us? Or do we trust in God regardless of what we're facing and what we're seeing? Do we trust in God to be the one that's going to be the source of our strength? That's the answer. And we face this a lot of times in our everyday life. And once again, if you allow fear to come in because the enemy and his devices or the schemes of people coming against you seem to be greater than, you know, you being alone coming against them. You might have to ask yourself whether you're truly trusting in the arm of flesh. You know, am I smart enough? Am I strong enough? First of all, why are you even trusting in yourself? Trust in the Lord. Amen. <laughs> With all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord, and he will give you the capacity to overcome everything that's coming your way. And with that strength comes the comfort where fear will not box you in and make you feel that you're going to be sifted as weak by the enemy and their attacks. Uh, let's look at another one. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 5 through 8. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabit it. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in a year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So look at that. Cursed be the man that trusted in man. Now I'm not saying that each one of us, if we're fearful of people, that oh, I'm a cursed person now. What I'm saying here is that we cannot allow ourselves to be in a situation where we trust in the strength of people that are opposing us or um, various things that we face in life. We can't get to the place where we're so overwhelmed and full of fear because of what we see or what might occur that we start to deviate. As we see here, we allow our hearts to depart from the Lord. And I've seen people do that from time to time. You know, they're, they're very faithful while things are going good, but as soon as you know, trials and tribulations face them, all of a sudden, what happened to sister or brother so-and-so? You know, they allow the fear 
or the situation to cause them to depart from walking in spirit and truth with the Lord. And unfortunately, sometimes try to um, negotiate with the world system or uh, have various compromises that are not walking in spirit and truth in the world. And, and you may not be cursed, cursed, but there's times where you face the consequences of the things that you're doing. So we have to make sure in every situation that we don't allow ourselves to once again depart or deviate from the word of God and compromise it and that we continue to trust the Lord. As we see here in verse 7, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. We're blessed when we stand still. We're blessed when we continue to profess and believe God in his word. And there's times where you might go through a long period where it seems like God's not listening, God's not moving, nothing's occurring. But the key thing for each one of us is to continue to study God's word, to, to meditate upon it, to pray and believe God, and, and once again, pray things according to um, godly things manifesting, even though we don't see them yet. And most of all, in our profession, to continue to proclaim the promises, the faithfulness, and the goodness of God, despite what we're dealing with in the current time and season. You know, as we know, Mark went through the, 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 the situation with his kidneys. What was that, over two years that y'all had to stand firm in that? It's yeah. probably about over, over two years. My, myself, I went through, you know, the surgery, um, financial difficulties. But I think the true measure of surviving the challenge at hand, that no matter what we saw in the natural, whether it was financial, physical, bad medical reports, no matter what it was, we continue to profess the word of God and trust him even in our worst moments. And here we are standing, and you know, I've just celebrated my ninth anniversary of coming out of my surgery, amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Coming out of that and knowing that through that profession and continue to trust God, I might not see the blessings right now, but the blessings are surely on the horizon. We cannot allow fear and faithlessness to take hold of our circumstances. Amen? 17 years, July 12th. Praise the Lord. All right. How many is 17? 17. Wow, 17 years. Amen? Of God's miracle. Because that's surely what it is. 17 years of God's miracles in play. And see, that's one good thing for us to know. You might be dealing with daunting circumstances right now. But hold fast to your faith. Don't allow fear to come in. You know, sometimes you got to profess the promises of God and the faithfulness of God, even though things literally get worse after you start your profession. Amen? we got to continue to speak towards God's promises. And, and, and sometimes we may not necessarily totally feel what we're saying right now, but you keep saying it till it becomes genuine inside of you. You know, I like the fact that, you know, you had the man with, with Jesus, and my, my child keeps throwing himself in the fire, and, you know, the demons are tormenting him. And Jesus said, do you believe? And he said, yes, Lord, I believe. But help me with my unbelief. It's this little smidgen of unbelief that was in his heart. But look what Jesus said. Jesus said, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but Jesus is like, I can work with that. Amen? See, you ain't got to necessarily be this supernatural giant all the time. There are going to be times where, in, like I said, in our humanity, we suffer from fear and anxiety. And it's nothing for us to be embarrassed of. Just confess it before the Lord. You know, the problem we have a lot of times is people go confessing all their fear to other people. Amen. <laughs> I'll say that again. They go confessing their fear to other people. And what you don't realize is when you're going and spreading that negative word and speaking out of your fear, and you're supposed to be a strong, wise saint, you're actually corrupting or contaminating their lives with fear as well. Well, if God ain't coming through in your situation, why would he come through for me? Especially if I'm a less mature Christian. Why would God do anything for me? And if they're unsaved, they really have no hope from the profession that's coming out of our mouths. So sometimes you've got to say it. Until you believe it. Amen? Amen? You know, in the sports world, we talk about having on your game face. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I played basketball. There was times, I remember one time I was playing uh, basketball in the summer league. And um, we had a good, we were having a good season so far, but this one particular game, we were facing the best team in the league. So everybody's like, ah, you know, your winning streak's going to end tonight. 
I said, oh, no, it ain't. We're going to take it to them. And uh, so we had this game. We're going back and forth. We're going back and forth. They got the lead by 10. We come back, take the lead by four. We're going back and forth, back and forth. Then we get to the, the final uh, minute of the game. We're down by one point. They have the ball. They come down, shoot the, shoot the ball. I jump up, grab a rebound. A guy fouls me. Stupid because they had a one-point lead yep. and only a couple seconds. Fouls me, put me on the line. Now, at that time, I was more of like a, you know, take it to the hole, layups, dunk the basketball. Um, if you gave me a bank shot, I'd make it, but I wasn't, I was like an average at best free throw shooter. So the guy that fouls me, I'm going out of line. He said, we won this game. You have no chance whatsoever of making those free throws. Man, Fox, you're going to blow those two free throws. I was like, thank you for saying that. Now I'm making both of them. I got to that line, swish, swish. We beat the, the we beat the undefeated team in that legit <laughs> Now if he didn't say anything, he might be like, I wanna go ahead. <laughs> oh, you talking trash. Now I'm motivated. I close my eyes and hit him. <laughs> but no, sometimes you gotta have your game face on. Hey Amen. You gotta let the devil know I'm not afraid of you. Even if you got a little bit of fear. See, we 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 telegraph our insecurities. And sometimes we speak to our insecurities, and, you know, the devil's sitting there listening, like, oh, they're afraid. Oh, you're afraid of clowns? I'm going to send ten clowns your way. Mm -hmm. Maybe not clowns. But I'm just saying, sometimes we telegraph uh, our insecurities, our fears, and our inadequacies. We need to be like that um, deodorant commercial. Um, what was it, sure? Never let, let, let them see you sweat. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> and you might be sweating, like, oh, boy. <laughs> Going to that meeting, hmm. never let them see you sweat. I tell people all the time, like, and, and I've given people tips. Um, uh, there's been times I've been, as a software engineer, interviewed by uh, a person one on one, multiple interviews. There's been times I've literally had interviews and I walk in a room and it's a conference table, like 15 people, just bam, 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 hit me in questions. And the thing is, like a lot of people, before I go into the interview, especially if there's a drive, you know, you have a little nervousness, you know, okay, it's going to be a rough interview, aggressive interview, it's going to be like, you know, a little easy one, and, you know, and, and I go into this one meeting, and um, like I said, I, think I, I come in, and I walk into that room, and it's, oh, well, I put that game face on, ready to go. First question, bam, second question, bam. Another guy asked me a question, he thinks it stumped me. I was like, gotcha, and I see you double. <laughs> and I handled my business, but I went in with my game face on. You know, we have to have the mentality that I'm more than a conqueror, amen? I'm a son of the whole most high king. I'm a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I'm not gonna walk around here with my shoulders drooped, looking all pitiful and letting the devil know I'm afraid of what he's gonna to do to me. No, you need to let the devil tremble at your presence. Walk with your head high, amen? Armed with the weapons of your warfare, with the profession of faith in God, amen? And do it, once again, until the devil starts to tremble and back off of you. We spend too much time being the devil's punching bag or his doormat, instead of walking around as the champions that Jesus Christ has called us to be. So we should not be walking, you know, with our heads drooped down, afraid of what's going to happen to us next. No, we should be thinking, what am I going to do to the kingdom of darkness next? We are not called to be people that are bound by the spirit of fear. We, once again, we have power and love and a sound mind. And if you don't have power and love and a sound mind, guess what? That's the next journey you need to go on on your life, amen? Think of it as the Chronicles of Narnia. Think about it as the Lord of the Rings. I'm going on a quest. Where are you going to find power, love, and a sound mind? Is it over here? Okay, I took a step. Oh, no, there ain't no love over there. Okay, well, maybe I need to go back the other direction. I'm on a quest to find power and love and a sound mind, and I'm not going to stop this journey until I reach that destination. Amen? No longer being trapped by fear, overwhelmed, overcome. Devil just kicking me around like I'm a 95-pound weakling. You are not a 90-pound, 90 95-pound weakling. You are a champion. Amen? You are the best of the best. You are the cream of the crop. And even when you lose, you're still victorious. Amen? Because you're walking in Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. And in him we live and move and have our being. If we're in him, amen, the king of the universe, the Lord of Lord, the king of kings, how can we ever be walking around all beat up and all fearful and all weak and inadequate? No, we are more than that. 
See, we have fear when we take ourselves outside of the confines of what God has called us to be, and we're walking at a lower level based upon what the world system has deceitfully taught us that we are. Amen? Amen. And once again, deceitfully spoken and taught us. You are not the things that the world has said about you. You are not stupid. You are not inadequate. You are not worthless. You are not about content. You are not a runt. You are not inadequate. You are a champion of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. And we need to start walking around with this, and that spirit of fear has to depart. Amen. So if you got fear, tell that sucker to get out of your life. Yes. Amen? I remember one time, I, I told you guys before, I was, uh, I was a little crazy when I was younger. <laughs> Still a little crazy. But um, we were in a, the, um, the, we, went, we had a, um, a temporary zoning thing when we bought our home. And as part of that agreement, there were certain things that didn't pass zoning with the city of Voorhees. So the owner of the property said um, he would do them. And it was in the closing agreement that he would do that. So we went to closing. I got a house. And, you know, I'm talking to the guy. And, and then later on, I call him up and say, hey, Bob, so um, when are you going to get around to the thing so we can get through the temporary uh, CCO over to fully um, done. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to just throw a lattice over it. I said, no, it's going to look ugly. No, you can't do that. You got to do it right. Because it has a fan, you know, our deck has like a fan effect. I said, no, you got to fill in there. Oh, I ain't doing all that. You want to do that? You can. You can pay for it. Well, I'm just throwing a lattice over it. I said, no, that's going to look crappy, man. You can't do that. He said, well, you can think wherever you want. I'm not going to do it. So I'm in my car, you know, I was like, I got to get off. <laughs> And we started an argument. And I'm driving from Trenton at the time, coming down 295 South. And I'm just like, I'm groaning. And I was like, you know, I need to start praying because I'm going to say the wrong thing. So I start praying, and the Lord gives me peace. And, and I go from peace to, you know, then I start to feel powerful and stuff like that. And I was like, the devil's trying to come in my head and my thought life and, and make me angry and, and bitter and say the wrong thing. And I remember one time, I'm going out 295. Right, 75 miles an hour, I open that door and say, double get out of my car. Yeah. Yeah. Be messing with me. Now, y'all don't do that. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that anymore. Like I said, I was a little younger. <laughs> Kyle Trey, do not open your doors and kick the devil out. Pull over to the shoulder, open the door. <laughs> and when you do it, whatever size shoe you wear, you wear, put it way up there in the center of his rear end. <laughs> Don't be nice. <laughs> the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Take your blessing by force. We walk around here all pitiful and fearful. Amen? <laughs> oh, Lord. All right, so as we see here, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord whose hope the Lord is. And what happens? He shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. You see, when you allow um, your, your trust to remain in the Lord, and you don't deviate or compromise or allow fear to come into your heart and to your mind, when you do all these things, you know, it says here that you'll be like a tree planted by the waters. And I don't know if you've ever had to do a lot of yard work, but boy, you know, you get a tree that gets up under a certain part. I just actually, I just went out this, this past week. I have a shed, and there's a tree that was smaller, and I was like, oh, a little thicker. And I was like, I gotta get out there. I said, next thing you know, that thing's gonna have roots all up underneath my shed. Next thing you know, my shed that I've had probably, I think we got that shed a couple years within a year or so after we moved in and it's still in great condition you know the the, the roof the, you know has lightened some from you know oxidation in the sun but it's not leaking it's in good shape so i said it's a shame you know structurally sound roof not leaking and then to allow the tree to grow get the roots under there and the next thing you know the thing's getting ripped apart so i was like you know i got to deal with this thing before the foundation gets you know torn up on the ground by the tree so i actually got out there um, earlier this week, and I, I, I cut that down. But you got to be the same. One of the things we need to do as saints of God, we need to be like those trees. You may not be rooted deep in the Word of God or necessarily trusting God and, and, and coming through and being the, the, your source of strength and your refuge in time of trouble. You need to get 
by the presence of the Lord to saturate yourself. You know, the, the, the water is going to be representative of the Holy Spirit. And you allow yourself through the word of God to root yourself deep. So when trials and tribulations come your way and fear try to come in, it doesn't uproot you and topple you so that, you know, the Lord will find, oh, they weren't deeply rooted in the word. You have to allow yourself to get rooted deeply in the word regardless of your circumstances. And here it says, it shall not see when the heat cometh. That doesn't mean that the heat doesn't come. Did you, you notice that? It says, shall not see when the heat come. In other words, the heat may come, but because I've rooted myself deep and I'm bringing in life-giving water, the heat doesn't become my obsession and my focus, and I'm still grounded, I'm still being nourished, and saturated with the, the nourishment the Lord provided, as we see here, even though the heat is coming, my leaves are staying green, not because of what is above, but because I'm rooted deep and I'm bringing in enough nourishment to keep myself thriving. So you got to do the same thing. You got to root yourself deep. There's going to be trials. There's going to be times where you feel the heat of this world system pouring down upon you. We're in a heat wave right now. To say it can feel like it's over 100 degrees a day. Well, you can go out there in the heat, but if you know how to saturate yourself okay, you'll be okay. You won't get dehydrated and pass out and end up in the hospital. We got to do the same thing regarding the trials and tribulations we face in life. And here's the thing. Don't wait until the crisis decide to get nourishment. It's too late. It's too late. You know, when I was on doing um, Taekwondo, every, each one of my black belt tests, they would have a start off running 15 miles. And here's the thing, we couldn't um, put on a pair of shorts and a t-shirt to be comfortable. He would make us put on a whole uniform. I'm talking about this thing's full length, going down, wrapped around the belt, and I, I wear a t-shirt underneath as well because it would start to open up. If I had a t-shirt, it seems like the, the, my, my gi would stay tight. So we had to run five miles, and I'm running and everything, and um, he warned us beforehand. He said, don't wait to the day before to start drinking. You gotta hydrate all week. And I would do that, I would just drink and drink and drink. I'm not even thirsty, I'm just drinking. I'm preparing for the heat. I'm preparing for the time where I got to endure and go through physical trial. So I'm gonna hydrate all, all week. And once I got there, I got a little thirsty, but I was able to run and I always got to the finish line in a good amount of time. Some of the people that drank that morning, or drank the day before, they were just like, whoop, whoop, gagging, dehydrated. Some of them can't finish the test because they did not prepare themselves before the trial. We have to prepare ourselves before the heat and the trials and tribulations of this life occur. And that's how it works with fear too. You know, if you notice an area of your life where anxiety comes in, why do you wait to the time of the crisis? They're like, oh, now I'm going to set, uh, I, I fear clowns. Let me go study some crap, some, some scriptures related to my fear of clowns. Well, shoot, it's all over you now. <laughs> Amen. You can't wait until the crisis is hitting you to decide that you want to now start to pray or to fast or study the word. You have to study to show yourself approved beforehand so that when the crisis hits, you're already strong in the Lord, fortified. And here's the thing. The principles in the word of God that are necessary to, to overcome the fear you're currently facing will come back to your remembrance yeah. in your time of need so that you can respond to what the devil is sending your way. Amen. And that's the pattern that Jesus Christ gave us in the wilderness. You know, notice that when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness after his 40 days of fasting, he didn't just respond to the devil with anything. He responded with the exact scriptural principles that would counteract and overcome the attack that the devil tried to level his way. So he was very deliberate and very precise in how he counteracted the attacks of the enemy. If you're doing some type of fear, you need to do the same thing. Amen? You know, you, your fear of being broken and without and suffering lack and poverty. You need to rehearse scriptures like, in him I live and move and have my ability being. I, and my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Find scriptures that counteract the thing that tries to bring fear into your heart. Amen. Amen. You're suffering from physical disease, some type of sickness. You know, you're worried about a medical diagnosis. Go through the scriptures that relate to the healing power of God to fortify yourself so that fear gets automatically kicked to the curb when it tries to come in. When I was facing my surgery, I had two pages of scripture. 
And I went through them over and over again in preparation for my surgery. And when the day of my surgery came, I was supposed to, um, I think my surgery was supposed to be 10 o'clock. And I'm sitting there in the waiting room because they didn't pull me back late um, yet. So anyway, um, I'm like, okay, well, hmm, nobody's coming to get me yet. I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there, and Pam's with me, and Gigi's with me, all of a sudden I feel, hmm, why didn't they call me back yet? See, that's what happens. Yep. Your brain starts yep. them questions. Yep. Why didn't they bring me back yet? What's wrong? <laughs> But see, before I could start to have those imaginations, well, maybe the machine broke. Maybe yeah. the surgeon's having a bad day. Oh, maybe they killed somebody on the tape. Before all those things would come in, as soon as I heard in my spirit, why didn't they come to get me yet? I was like, ah, I ain't got time for that. I reached into my bag, grabbed my scriptures, and here's the thing. As soon as I read my first healing verse, I was like, I'm good. Fear just lifted right off. I read the rest of the pages, too. But here's the thing. By the time I read through the first passage, I was like, thank you, Jesus. I'm okay. And I stood, I was sitting there another hour. They operated on me. Everything was a success. And here's the thing. I found out later on that my roommate in the hospital, he was the reason for delay. He actually apologized to me. And from the fear that overcame him, he literally passed out. So that pushed all the other surgeries back. And he's apologizing. But... I was able to minister to him, man, you know, you're okay, you know, hey, sometimes fear takes hold, and, you know, I was able to talk to him, and we, you know, still, you know, call each other on the phone, hey, man, how you doing, and we call ourselves the prostatectomy brothers, and stuff like that, or the da Vinci brothers, and, you know, so we maintain a relationship, so the Lord even turned it around so I could help minister to him regarding the fear that he suffered over that process, <laughs> praise the Lord, all right, um, Next one I have is Isaiah 41, 8 through 13. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. For I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. And they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Look at that. Look at the promises of God. And, and notice, God has no problem talking about fear. <laughs> but God says, Fear thou not. God's never going to tell you to be feared. The only time he will tell you fear is the reverential type of fear. You know, don't fear those who could kill the body and after that have nothing to do with you. Fear him who, after you die, can cast you into hell. Fear him. Have reverential fear. But as it relates to the world system and its devices, whether they are natural or supernatural in, in nature, God says, fear them not. Why? Because I am with you. And see, here's the thing. That's what fear does. Fear takes your mind of, of the ever-present um, uh, governing of your life by God. Fear makes you think, I'm in this all alone. Fear makes you say, the thing that's coming at me, I have no solution, and it's going to pounce over me and, 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 and cripple me or, or, or kill me or do all these things. Fear makes you say that I'm distant and aloof from an ever-present God. That's exactly what it does. And then here's the thing, you know, God is omniscient, he's around us all the time. David said, if I lay my bed in hell, you are there. And we ain't trying to go there. But that's how <laughs> David is giving an illustration that no matter how deep, dark, and dank the situations that I face might be, God is present there. But the thing is, can you perceive him? Can you see him? Can you feel him? And most of all, can you remain attached to believe in him, profess his glory, his honor, and his love for you, and sincerely believe 
that God's going to be there for you. Look what God says as it relates to, to the attacks of our enemies. Number one, he says, don't be dismayed. Why? Because I'm your God. I got this. Why are you going to allow yourself to get all overwhelmed, heart racing, can't sleep, hair falling out, fingernails and nubs? Whether it be fingers or your toes. I don't know how, I don't know how gifted you are. <laughs> anyway, but do not be dismayed. Why? Because I am with you. In other words, don't let yourself get to the place where you think, I'm in this all alone. It's just me. I'm discouraged and depressed. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody understands how I feel and how this is making, like I said, overwhelming me with fear and, and, and trepidation. Nobody understands. Well, God understands. And he says, I am with you. That's all you need to know. Amen. And the Holy Spirit, the comforter, will give you the strength. And matter of fact, that's the next point. Don't be dismayed because I'm your God and I will strengthen you. Then he says, not only will I strengthen you, but I will help you. What kind of help do you need? Is it witty ideas? Is it just the power to endure? Is it resources? Whatever you need, God says, I will help you. And he says here, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. The enemy will come at you with an arm of flesh. God said, I ain't need an arm. A hand. And pick you up out of your circumstances. And let you overcome the devices of the enemy. Then he says that he's going to, they're going to be ashamed. They're going to be confounded. He's going to render them null and void. Amen. It's going to be as if they never existed. You know, uh, and, we, and we've seen that from time to time. I remember hearing this, this story of a situation in Israel years ago where uh, these troops were, were coming around. They were, the, the, the Germans were um, coming in, and uh, these, these Israeli soldiers were uh, trying to get to a place of safety, and they ended up coming around this corner, and when they came around the corner, they're staring right in the face of a tank. And they're standing there like, uh-oh. <laughs> There's bad enough guns. Uh, we're looking down the barrel of a tank. But for some reason, they never fire. Troops never fire. It's just like frozen. They're like, what in the world's going on? So they finally get enough comfort to walk up to the tank. They climb up on top. They open it. And when they open it and look down, and the men inside the tank, the men are all like, like this face of sheer horror. And they, the men literally told them later on, it's like, we saw these tall, angelic beings and we, we were like frozen, couldn't move because of sheer horror. So uh, God must have sent his angels to intervene to spare the lives of these people. So sometimes God will do stuff in a supernatural, sometimes he'll do it in natural. But regardless, God is telling us here, do not be afraid of those that will contend with you. I am with you, and I will give you the help, the strength, and all the resources you need. And once again, no matter how strong the enemy may see, seem to be, God will give you the strength to overcome everything that they might send your way. Amen? Praise the Lord. Uh, let me see here. Thank you, Jesus. Let's see what time we got here. Okay, I'll do another. Um, a second cause of fear is that sometimes people trust in the natural... <coughs> more than they trust in God. Trust in the natural more than they do in God. And of course, nobody's ever going to admit that. Oh, no, no, I, I trust God in all situations. Why are you murmuring and complaining? <laughs> Why are you saying, oh, well, I don't know if things are going to change. Oh, nothing ever works out for me. You're full of faith. I hate to see you when you're... <laughs> Discouraged. <laughs> Some of the stuff that comes out of believers' mouth sometimes. You know, if you're full of faith, then good Lord. Um, I hope I'm never full of faith. <laughs> That's the definition of it. <laughs> so when you're trusting in the natural more than God, this type of fear comes when we look at our natural circumstances and fail to view them from the perspective of God. And that can relate to things such as finances, uh, negative medical diagnoses, um, jobs, economy, um, career outlook, uh, academic pursuits. It can come in all different categories. And, you know, there's, a, there's one thing between, there's a difference between if we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing 
and being good stewards of our time, talents, and energy and resources. It's another thing when we are doing all that we can and then we allow fear to come in of, oh, well, what's going to be the outcome of this? You know, quite frankly, if it's something that's meant for us from God, God's going to work it out uh, if we truly love him. And, man, we're devoted to him. He's going to work things all together for the good, you know, to all those who love him and keep his commandments. That's one thing that people forget sometimes. You know, well, I love God. Yeah, but are you doing the other parts of that scripture? You can't just pull out one part, I love God. Well, you love God when you obey God and keep his commandments. So if you're doing your due diligence to serve God faithfully in the spirit of truth, God will ensure that everything turns out the good for your life. And here's the thing. Sometimes we define something as being the good and uh, that God has for us. And God may have another plan. So we got to also distinguish between what we think is the perfect solution or outcome and what God actually had in, in mind for us. Sometimes it's not the devil defeating us when something doesn't occur. Sometimes, no, God has put his hand in the road saying, that's not the path for you. Go in this other direction. So once again, um, sometimes that we look at natural circumstances and um, because we're not seeing them from the perspective of God, we allow fear to come in. You know, it could be negative thoughts. It could be um, our own natural thoughts. It could be thoughts that the enemy tries to plant in our head. It could be things that we hear. Once again, it could be um, experiences that we encounter that cause us to take our eyes off of God and our level of trust for him starts to sink down and fear comes in. Uh, let's look at Proverbs 15, 29 through 30. It says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayer of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoiceth the heart, and a good report maketh the bones fat. So I'm sure all of us today say, well, I'm not wicked, so I don't have to worry about the being far from me part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then we see a guarantee here that he hears the prayer of the righteous. And if we're dealing with situations where we're feeling a little anxious and a little overwhelmed, uh, why are we allowing ourselves to get to the place where we're saying, has God even heard me in my circumstances? I truly believe that when we're praying for God to turn the situation around to, or to resolve some crisis that we're facing, sometimes God will immediately deal with it, whether it's natural or supernatural. God will remedy the situation quickly. But I believe in those times where we don't get the solution that we're expecting or things don't come out the way that we desire. I don't think it has anything to do with God's level of love dissipating in the least. First of all, that cannot happen. You can't sin enough to make God not love you. And God will reprove you and chastise you as children, but you cannot make God love you less. It just cannot happen. Amen? So, and then in terms of... Um, just our day-to-day our, our -day things and the things we experience. Like I said, sometimes God will give us a quick answer, but then sometimes God will allow things to occur because there's something that he's honing and refining or allowing us to learn from our trials and tribulations. So sometimes, sometimes we're just going to go through because God said, hey, I'm honing something in you, and you're going to come out on the other side stronger or more faithful. You're going to sharpen and use your spiritual gifts you know, sometimes we're just going to learn life lessons through the adversity that our face. I'm sure, like I said, Mark and I, from the situation we face, we have a certain level of wisdom that came out of that experience. And I've had a number of times over the years, I shared when I went to that period of adversity, and I knew God to be a healer, and especially a healer of cancer. I prayed for people that had cancer and they got healed. Amen? So I know God will heal you supernaturally when you pray for somebody for cancer because I prayed and if I literally, I, I preached at a conference one time, this man was there, I never laid an eye on him. And we got to the, to the end, I was closing out in prayer, had an altar call, I called this woman up and I prophesied over her ministry. She was out of Atlanta, I'd never seen her before. And she said, you hit everything that was going on in my life. Then I called that man over, he had a cane. And I said, curse that cancer at his root. And later on, they called me up a couple months later and he says, medically confirmed, his cancer is gone. So I know God has healed people of cancer and I pray for people and had it happen. So when cancer hit my life, I was like, I know you're healing. I'm like, Lord Jesus, and you know, Pam is praying, and all y'all praying for me, and believing God for my healing. And, you know, uh, matter of fact, before I got the diagnosis, I was like, I know I ain't got no cancer. <laughs> I ain't got no cancer. <laughs> so I go into the thing, and Pam's about to take the day off, you know, to, to go to the doctor with me. I was like, take the day off for what? <laughs> I don't got no cancer. 
I walk myself in there to get my confirmation. I walk in there, he's smiling, his laptop comes in. Oh, you got three parts of your prostate. I was like, oh, I was expecting that. <laughs> so all of a sudden, uh, this room's getting a little hot. Yeah. <laughs> Beads of sweat. <laughs> I was like, oh, I do have cancer. But here's the thing, by the time I came out of that office and he was positive, he said, man, he said, we're not gonna do any chemo or radiation, do surgery. You know, be in for a few hours out the next day, man. We're just going to deal with that 100%. Be done with it. I said, that's right. I said, we're going to have some pep rally here. That's right. <laughs> Called in a couple of nurses. Uh, give me, here's some pop pies. Cheer. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, then the guy, and here's a, here's a blessing of God. When, when you have a, you trust in God and allow, don't allow fear to come in, the man is like, he said, well, I can do your surgery, Brian. But he said, if you don't mind, he said, hey, it's like I'm a, I'm a pianist. But he said, this guy over here, he trains other doctors. He's like a virtuoso that trains people like me. He says, so if you don't mind, you know, I'll give you over him. I said, you, you, give, you could do like an Uncle Phil and toss me over to the other guy. <laughs> so the Lord blessed me, moved me on the other thing. And I still was praying and believing God for healing of my cancer. But then when I got closer to the actual process, I was like, Lord, I know you can supernaturally heal me because you've done it. You know, in my life with the, with the asthma, I say, you've done it, cancer in the lives of other people. Actually, I prayed for Sister, Ka Sister Kathy before over, over cancer, too. And it came back, and it was gone. And it was in the exact spot on her body where the Lord had me lay my hand. So, so I've seen it happen a couple times in my life. And I was like, but you know what, Lord? You know, if I'm going to go the surgical route, I'm still believing you to be my healer. And I want you to show me exactly what you want to do so I can have a testimony of your glory out of the circumstances. See, we have the ability to say what the devil meant for evil and fear, I'm going to turn around for good and for testimony for God's kingdom. Amen. And I was praying. And one day I'm just minding my business. I'm praying. And I asked the Lord, I said, you know, just show me what you want to bring out of this. Show me why you allow me to keep the cancer. And I'm just praying one day. I, I forgot I haven't mentioned that to God. And all of a sudden. He just speaks it so clearly. Sometimes a vial has to be burst so the ointment can come out. Or pierced so it can come out. He said, sometimes a tree has to be tapped so its sap can flow down. He was showing me, he said, I'm allowing you to be pierced so I can use your life to minister ointment and healing in the lives of others. And I had so many people over the years, amen, that, amen, he said he's allowed me to share the testimony of what he's done. Amen. And um, I have people that still, when they're going near tests and their tests don't sound right, they call me out. What do you think about this? This one guy, you know, tough New York City police officer and um, macho guy. And he had the surgery and I, I got him through that and prayed him through that. And then the following year he had to do a checkup and his, his numbers were higher than they expected. So he called me up and said, man, you know, uh, Brian, I'm just going to be honest, man. He said, you know, I'm really afraid. So I'm going to tell, tell my wife. But he said, man, I'm afraid, man. The numbers are high. I said, man, we ain't worried about that. So we're going to pray and believe God. So we prayed, and I said, you know what? I said, I said you know what, man, go to, I said, did you change labs? Did you use the same doctor? Did you use the same lab? He said, no, I went to another lab. I said, man, those machines are probably off. I said, go to another lab. So he goes back. Um, he gets a, a, a script. He goes to another lab. This is blood tested. Everything comes out normal. Wow. But see, fear tried to come into his life. And see, sometimes we not only are aid, need to overcome fear in our own life, but we need to speak peace in the lives of other people that are encountering fear. And here's the thing. What if I allow my own circumstance to be a source of fear? I never have been in a place to minister peace and healing in the lives of somebody else. See, sometimes it's not just about us when things come our way. And we got to trust God. And we see here the light of the eyes rejoice in the heart. See, Jesus is the light of our lives. Amen. He should be the light of our eyes. And no matter what we face, fear should not come in. The light of Jesus Christ should come in all the time, bright as the sun. As we see here, we allow the light of the eyes to come in. It makes our heart rejoice when fear would try to come in. You know, the word of God tells us to keep our heart. Amen. That word keep it means to guard your heart. Amen. To place a guard around your heart. And a lot of times we don't guard our heart. And we especially don't guard our thought life. And you got to be careful about that. There's a reason why Jesus Christ, I mean, why the book of Ephesians, when it talks about the weapons of a warfare, it talks about the helmet of salvation. Think about that. As soon as you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he gives you the helmet of salvation. Why? To protect your brain. 
Amen? To protect the mind of Christ that's supposed to be in you. And if you don't keep that helmet on and you allow fear to come in, fear will overtake you. And, and here's the problem of not guarding your thought life and protecting yourself with the helmet of salvation. If it starts to get into your head, then it starts to trickle down. Well, first of all, it starts to saturate your whole brain. And every time you think of it, and every time somebody else speaks of it, and every time you read about it, fear starts to go further and further uh, into your, the pathways of your brain. That's Dr. Car Caroline Leaf, a neurologist, an actual brain surgeon. She actually talked about that. You build pathways in your brain. If you allow fear to saturate your brain, it starts to build new pathways. Instead of pathways that will strengthen you or renew you, they are pathways that automatically cause your brain to shift your perceptions in a certain direction. So if you allow fear to take hold of one part of your mind, it'll start taking part of every aspect of your life. It won't settle for just being a fear in one area. Like I said, you can have fear of breathing. And you don't deal with that. Okay, every time you hear about asthma, you feel like, I'm a little stuffy. The fear will come in. The next you know, Oh, I heard a noise. Okay, now I got fear of breathing and the noise. Next you know, oh, I got to climb up that ladder. Fear of the, the breathing and the noise and the darkness and the ladder and the car accident and the plane falling on my... I mean, it just never stops because it takes hold of your mind. And here's the thing. Once it takes hold of your mind and you don't use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, that's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart to purge that stuff in... It goes from your mind, and now it starts to filter itself down your heart. And as the word says, as a man thinketh in his what? His heart, so is he. So in other words, you become a person that was initially pondering things and getting anxious to a person that is literally the core of your being, your heart, is saturated with fear. And you're walking around on a daily basis instead of being powerful. And insightful and an asset to the kingdom of God. And somebody that ministers healing and deliverance and salvation to other people. Now you're walking around somebody that's just so beat up. You have no power whatsoever to witness in the lives of others. John 10.10 10 says, the, key, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it what? More abundantly. That phrase more abundantly means super abundant. Life without measure. But notice this, the thief cometh not but for. See, Satan ain't, ain't wasting his time. When he's coming at you, he's trying to do something that will cripple you, that will undermine you, that will strip you of all the peace and the comfort and the treasures that God has for your life. you got to protect those things. And once again, you got to make sure this stuff doesn't go for your mind and you use the creative energies of your mind to make a small problem into a mountain. And then next you know, it filters down into your heart and it just totally devastates every aspect of your, your walk with God. I shared before that each one of us lives in our own personal world or like a bubble universe. Amen. We might walk through the same places, drive to, to the same venues. Do to, to, to uh, attend the same type of events, but the way you encounter and experience something, even if we go through this, we can walk side by side, driving, we can go drive in a car there, walk side by side at the same exact event, yet we can see it two different ways. Why? Because each one of us has our own perceptions of reality. And see, here's the thing. I could go to that venue and say, man, I had the time of my life. So this person, that person, oh, the food was good. The music was great. Oh, it was just such a wonderful thing. Boy, it's such a shame it ended early. And I wish we could do it again. You could be like, it was the worst time of my life. Couldn't wait to leave. <laughs> and it could be because you ran into something. You know, you're walking through the room. People laugh. And they're laughing at something and they're sharing among themselves. But because of something happened to you, as you walk by and laugh, they're laughing at you. And the fear and the pain and anxiety comes in. So it actually corrupts your, your experience and it taints your perceptions. And that's what the devil wants to do in us as it relates to the area of fear. As, as we, we deal with uh, uh, things that we're encountering on a daily basis, he wants to distort and corrupt your perceptions of things. So you have to guard your mind and heart and be able to overcome the things that the enemy will send your way. In some cases, you have to overcome your own thoughts that have come up in your mind as you replay various things or you start to think a certain way that's contrary to the word of God. We see here, it says, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart. 
And it says, a good report maketh the bones fat. You have a choice of having a bad report in your circumstances and experiences, or you can say, I'm gonna have a good report even though things might have been a little off, a little dysfunctional, or not quite what I want them to be. I choose to rejoice. I choose to have a good report in all my encounters and experiences. And then it says here, if you have that mindset, it says it makes the bones fat. That word fat means to be satisfied. Amen. Then it also means to take away the ashes from. Don't you, you ever had an experience in your life that feels like everything burned up and it's irretrievable, can't be restored? Well, God says here, if you rejoice in your heart, you have a good testimony. That's what it's talking about, a good witness, a good report. He says, I'll take away the ashes from it. And I'll turn it around and make it something satisfying to you. And then here's a word I like as well. It says the word fat also means to be anointed. Anointed by God in the situations that you're dealing with. Amen. Praise the Lord. You can write this down for later. Romans 4, 13 through 22. It talks about faith. And gives us a story of Abraham and the things that he, him and uh, Sarah went through. One of the things I really liked about it, it says he, he, did, he did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. He didn't allow fear and unbelief to come in. But it said he was strong in faith and gave glory to God despite the experiences and the difficulty and the impossibility of what he was facing. And it says being fully persuaded of what he had promised, he was also able to perform and Abraham's faith was accounted unto him as righteousness. But one of the things that's really important, though, is so says God who quickens the dead and calls forth those things which be not as though they were. When you're dealing with fear, don't sit there obsessing over, oh, it's this bad, and this is about to happen, and it's only going to get worse. Worse, Amen? Speak those things that be not as though they were. Think about that. You're speaking to the future about something that you want to manifest as if it's in the past when it arrives. You're time traveling. <laughs> Once again, you're speaking in the future. I believe in God that this is going to occur. And when it manifests, you're looking at it as if, hey, it's just arrived, but it was already assured and guaranteed for me in the first place. Amen? We got to have the same type of man, uh, mindset that Abraham had. That even though uh, the thing that is giving me anxiety and fear has not been abolished or exterminated yet. I'm going to speak to the future where God's going to give me the solution and the remedy. And I'm going to receive the full blessings and the provision and the promises of God. My destiny is ensured in God. And there's nothing the enemy can do about it because God has already signed, sealed, and delivered it. And it's only my faith that will bring into manifestation in the future. But God's already, in other words, done the work to bring it to fruition. So now I'm just going to walk into what he had already provided for me in the first place. And if I don't allow my fear to get in the way and hinder me, I can have full assurance that God's going to do that. Uh, last verse for today, Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Faith is the substance. Amen. Do you realize your faith is a quantifiable substance in heavenly places? We think of it as something, you know, mental or intangible. Uh, you know, I can grab a chair. I can touch each one of you. You know, I can smell flowers. I can eat food and feel it. So sometimes we don't think of uh, faith as a quantifiable thing. But I think it's in the book of Romans. It says each, under each one of us is given a measure of faith. So in the physical realm, faith is not tangible or quantifiable, but in the spiritual realm, we're, we're, we actually have a measure of faith. And as we see here, it is the substance. It is a, the resource. It is the building material, in other words, of the things we want in God. And we spend too much time uh, trusting in the things that we fear and the power that they have over us um, on day-to-day -day experiences. And sometimes we actually 
uh, in, a, in a sense, distort our future because instead of us seeing it through the lens of God and the destiny that he has promised us as the author and finisher of our faith and the captain of our salvation, we look at the things we fear and we, uh, I know, God, you, you, you spoke this over my life and I know your word says this about me and what my capabilities are, but uh, I just can't get past this thing that's making me fearful. And we don't realize we're actually hindering ourselves from achieving the very thing that God wants us to walk in because we have to walk in it and reach the destination by walking in faith. So we cannot allow these things to do it. And once again, you have to realize that your faith is a commodity, amen, that is the resource, the foundation, the bedrock, the concrete, you know, the structure of the things that are, are to be manifested in your life. And the great thing about us being joint heirs of Jesus and brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, sometimes I might be dealing with anxiety. I can go to Trey and say, hey, Trey, you know, uh, I'm believing God. I'm professing, you know, well, this, you know, this little bit of unbelief in me. So, you know, I need a little fortification. So, hey, brother, you're my brother in Christ. So link arms with me and, hey, add substance to my faith. And let's join together and let's build this thing together in faith. And, and you can help service the bridge to get me to my destination. And if there's another time, you know, Kelly's going through, he might come and grab me and Bernice and Mark and Winnie and say, hey, uh, I, this is really a, a, a giant in, the, in, in front of me. There's an army in my path that's getting me, uh, uh, giving me trouble, preventing me from getting to my destination. So I need some people to help, you know, get me through that crisis. And let's all link arms together and pray and fast and believe God, you know, jointly. So sometimes we can't necessarily do it by ourselves. And sometimes we're dealing with a little bit of fear, but don't sit there getting trapped in your fear and, and, and curling up in a fetal position. And like I said, stressing yourself out until you almost about to stroke out or have a heart attack or go to the hospital. Go to your brothers and sisters of faith. And if you don't have enough faith on your own, go to other people that are fortified, that'll, that'll, that'll help quicken you and, and speak life into you and energize you and motivate and help uplift you in your times of trouble. Even Moses himself had to have his arms lifted up in that one battle, amen? And we all need to remember the words of the great patron saint, Saint Bernice, of, of West Berlin, who says the devil is a liar. <laughs> Those famous words that were spoken, I think it was like back in the 1500s. St. Bernice said it, and Josephus wrote it. Uh, the devil is a liar. I ain't receiving that. <laughs> you know, uh, we didn't have fun, but the fact is, you know, more people need to have that type of faith. I ain't receiving that. The devil's a liar. Amen. You need to have that profession. Oh, I hear the fear. Oh, I might, when I go to the doctor's for this report tomorrow, oh, they're going to say something bad. The devil is a liar. I ain't receiving it. If you can't say it for yourself, pick up the phone, call Bernice, text Bernice. You will be hearing that in your ears. If you call her, the devil is a liar. I ain't receiving it. Don't make me come over and shake you or shake the devil and the fear out of you. She'll shake, she'll shake the devil out of you. You're like, I didn't even know how the devil in me. I didn't know the spirit of fear was on me. By the time she shook me, I saw fear go over there, and it was launched over there, and she didn't kick the devil to the curb, and once again did the Uncle Phil and get out. She kicked that devil in the butt. I feel good now. <laughs> shake the devil out. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord. It's the evidence of things not seen. I'm a man of science. I'm a software engineer. I'm a science. I love exploring and reading up things on the universe. Just read up on, what was it, Oumuamua. Um, um, it was a celestial ob object about a half a mile long that they said they believe came from another uh, solar system or something like that. And they were filming it and analyzing it. So I, I love all that stuff. And like I said, I love science. And um, but, but we have to see here, too, faith is a substance, amen? It's the evidence, it's the, it's the proof in the spirit realm of things not seen. So you may not, in your own strength, know how to overcome your anxieties and fear, but grab yourself a bushel, a barrel, a gallon of faith and say, you know what? I'm not going to allow you to cripple me or tear down the foundation of my life here I'm going to go get a big cement truck full of faith, and I'm going to build myself a new walkway into my future and my destiny, because this is the evidence. You know, well, you can't get through that. Yes, I can. I got evidence. Where is it? Faith. That'll never work. God said it will. 
Well, show me the proof. What law, what reg regulation, what scientific thing, what medical diagnosis, what finding will prove it? Romans chapter 10. Ephesians chapter 1. <laughs> Use your faith as your evidence. And the world system may not believe it, but you can believe it. I had a doctor once that is no longer my doctor because after years and years of my chronic asthma, once again, which had me rush to the hospital, I think at least three times, life-threatened. One time out in Ohio. I just drove out to Ohio. Um, Gigi said, um, you know, I'm, get, I'm gonna get some new furniture here. You guys want it? Come get it. I'm on my way. I know Gigi's furniture. So I get out there. <laughs> I get out there and um, get to the house. And after we're there for a few minutes and it's on a hot day and it's, uh, I think it was early summer. And she said, oh, you wanna see these new plants I got out front? I'm like, oh, sure, Gigi. So I go outside and she shows me the plants and wow, these pretty flowers and these bushes look great. And I'm seeing them and sunny and stuff like that. Within 20 minutes, <laughs> this New Jersey body with asthma was not ready for the pollen and stuff out of Ohio. So what started out as a great, beautiful day ended up with within probably another half hour, we're in the hospital and here's this probably 411 woman trying to carry me into the hospital where I could barely walk. I mean, it was, it was really bad enough should have called an ambulance by the time I got to the hospital. And they had me in there, uh, gave me a shot, had me sucking in this mist that would um, break up the, the fluid, the mucus and everything, and clear up my lungs, and it's painful as so I'm breathing it in, and I get through that, and uh, needless to say, they, I had muscle spasms, they gave me medicine sent for that, they said, hey, you know, we recommend you stay here, you know, um, for a few days to get this into your system and stuff like that, and I'm like, I ain't missing Bible study. <laughs> so the doctor's like, no, 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 you need to give yourself a few more days, you know. He's like, when's your Bible study? I said, Wednesday. He said, no, 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 you need to work, wait at least a Friday or Saturday. He said, well, no, I ain't missing Bible study. I said, I don't miss, unless I have to, church or Bible study. I'm making Bible study. And here's the thing. I'm renting a big behind truck <laughs> to drive back to New Jersey, probably 13, 14 hours, by myself <laughs> with a truck full of furniture. So we load up the truck, and Gigi's kind of begging me, and Pam's kind of begging me, like, I ain't missing Bible study. I'm going, and God's going to get me through. Mm -hmm. So despite the fear I had over the asthma before and panic attacks and stuff like that from time to time, I was like, I'm not missing Bible study. I'm getting in the truck, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go. So I asked for a rental truck that has a cassette player, because back then it was cassette decks. Mm -hmm. It was actually before CDs, even. So I asked for that. I get there to the rental place. And they gave it to the previous customers. And I said, come on. I said, I need a tape back. I need to drive 14 hours with no music or anything. I said, sorry, sir. You know, we just you had to wait a day and we had to tape it. So I was like, all right. So I take the truck. She gives me a boom box. I get like two sets of, of D batteries so I can run out if necessary. Still have another set to get me there. So I'm driving. And I'm heading back to, to New Jersey from Ohio by myself. I drive a little bit. And all of a sudden, it's just like, man, I wonder if I miss a turn. Hmm. I don't recognize any of this. And I drive a little further. Maybe I recognize something. And I'm over an hour out. So I'm like, man, I still don't recognize anything. Maybe I should just turn back after all and go to Jesus' house and give myself a couple of days. But I was like, you know what? No, no I'm going to keep going. And the anxiety keeps building up. So I said, you know, put on some music. Brand new batteries. Pretty new boom box. Zilch. Pretty new batteries. Try again, nothing, won't play. And I'm feeling the anxiety start to come on me. And then all of a sudden, as we were driving there, there's this little tiny church that had this sign that had a statement on it. And just as I start, felt the fear start to get a little bit too heavy for me, I see that, it's like, ah, landmark, I'm good. So I'm driving, then I drive for another uh, couple of hours. At this point, it's like, ain't no turning back, man. <laughs> I'm like four hours in or whatever. And I start to feel a second attack of fear starting to come over me. And I'm praying and praying and praying. And the music still won't play. So then I'm like, oh man, maybe I should turn around after all. And all of a sudden, this woman in the van passes me real quick and pulls right in front of me with, you know, I like to pass people a couple car lengths. 
She comes up past and gets right in front of me. I look and her pl license plate says Psalms. Ooh, it's like, thank you, Jesus. Wow. I said, okay, cool. I got my second thing to overcome and I fear the, the, the fear come off. And then I'm driving and I was like, I'm good. And all of a sudden on impulse, I'm like, huh, I wonder. I push play. I did not change the batteries. All of a sudden, the boom box starts playing music. So we trust God, he'll get us over our anxieties, amen? And quite frankly, even the final testament I have here, it says that if we have faith in God and, and trust in our faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, the thing that I was seeing in my future that had not manifested yet, it's like I'm going to get full and complete healing from the asthma. And I had multiple times where I thought I was healed only for it to come back, and it was worse than the previous time. And I was still saying, I'm not giving up, I'm not giving up. And, and this one time, you know, I went to a, a, a doctor who used to take April through, you refer me, and I go in there for my normal treatment, and she checks my vitals and everything, she writes out a couple scripts, and she says, hello to your new wife. I did to Bernice, the devil, this is a lie. <laughs> and I came out of there, I said, you know what, asthma? You done taught me for the last time. And you done used that little tiny woman to do it. And I said, I'm done. It's war now. And I declare war. I'm here to tell you. Like, I probably, like, over 20 years now, probably about 20, let's see, 17 years in one time. I'm, I'm like, probably at least 25 years as my friend. Amen. Sometimes you got to get boxed in and attacked with fear so much that you finally said, enough is enough. You got to do like Popeye. I had all I can stand is I can't stand no more. Grab your spiritual spinach and whoop the devils behind. Amen. And that's what I did. And the last part of it says, for by it the elders obtained a good report. That phrase, obtained a good report, means to witness or testify to, to bear record. Sometimes as you're dealing with things, even though it brings in anxiety and fear, you got to say to yourself, I'm going to trust in God no matter what. I'm not going to be deterred. I'm not going to be confused or detoured. I'm going to continue to stand fast on God and believe him for the manifestation of the things I'm believing in by faith. Amen. And I'm not going to budge. And I'm going to have and see the things that I see in my future. And that is my good report and that is my testimony. And I'm not going to hear anything else. And then God will overcome those fears. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to stop there today. We'll continue on uh, next week uh, with this series. And um, let's just all rise, and I'll close in a word of prayer. But if somebody needs prayer, special prayer in the area of fear, please feel free uh, to come forward. Amen? Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, the honor, and praise for everything you're doing in our lives. And right now, Father, if anxiety or fear has tried to rear its ugly head in our lives, we just thank you right now that you give us the power, the authority through your word, the strength via your spirit to overcome it. That it would no longer have power over us, that it would not taunt us, that it would not box us in, that we would not sit around pondering or obsessing over the negative things that can occur in our lives. But instead, we would trust you, Father, at your word, um, by faith in you, as well as knowing your love for us, that you're going to enable us to overcome all forms of adversity, no matter what form they take, and no matter how great they are. And we just thank you, Father, that it's not in and of our own strength, our own uh, wisdom, our own witty ideas, our connections, our our finances or anything like that that we can overcome fear but it's by your spirit once again in your word that we can have victory over everything that would try to assault us we ask you right now father that uh, if there are any areas that start to um, repeat themselves in our minds you know through situational uh, occurrences through trauma through, through people in our lives that might speak things over us, through circumstances that we're evaluating, Lord, uh, through medical situations that cause us fear and anxiety. Right now, Father, we just speak peace over your people today, that you allow them to lay in their beds uh, like babies at night and get a good night's sleep. We praise and thank you, Father, as they're walking around on a daily basis, that as the enemy would try to um, assault their minds with fear, or even their own natural minds would 
uh, replay or, or ponder or uh, make up things in our minds, Father, imaginations that will cause us to be hindered. We praise you that you would immediately give us a verse of scripture, a song, something that would edify us and purge those things away, that once again they would not take hold of our minds and they would especially not take hold of our heart. And we just thank you, Father, for this. And finally, Lord, we just praise you that as you enable us to have victory over fear, you also give us the capacity to over be agents of salvation, reconciliation, and peace in the lives of others, that we would speak peace in their lives as well. And we just thank you and praise you, Father, for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.